know, and he was he was just like brutally consistent about that. I think he had mixed feelings about some forms of affirmative action, but that's beside the point. Um, I just think there's so this is a radical tradition that is flying in the face of the sort of chic uh, contemporary identitarianism. And that's that's another reason why I think Hitchens is is a powerful voice is because he he sort of represented that in a pretty compelling way. And I think just his his explicit anti-tribal focus, his explicit focus on universalism was valuable. And I, I wish the left would sort of rediscover it. Hello there, Matt. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. This is Glenn Lowry. This is The Glenn Show. I'm speaking with Matt Johnson, who's a writer, publishes on politics and culture in magazines and has a new book out uh, called uh, How... Hold on. What's it called again? Uh, How Hitchens Can Save the Left. How Hitchens Can Save the Left, Rediscovering Fearless Liberalism in an Age of Counter-Enlightenment. The great Christopher Hitchens can save the left. Uh, Matt, Matt is here to tell us exactly how that can happen. Uh, and uh, th- welcome, Matt. I'm, I'm Glenn Lowry. This is The Glenn Show. Uh, it is sponsored by the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research in New York City, uh, where I am John Paulson, senior fellow, and I'm also a professor of economics at Brown University. So um, welcome to The Glenn Show, Matt. Hey, thanks for having me. Christopher Hitchens, how'd you get onto that? Well, I've been reading his stuff and listening to him for many years. Uh, I got into him when I was a freshman in college. I think I was initially attracted to him for the same reason that many people will find themselves going down a Christopher Hitchens rabbit hole on YouTube today. Um, he's just such an eloquent, forceful speaker. And I, I really, and so, I mean, I was, I was into his atheism stuff early on. You know, it wasn't until a couple of years later that I got more into her, his political work and, and his political history. Um, but you know, it, it, he was just, he was just such an articulate, brutal presence on the debate stage, um, which is probably what initially attracted me to him. And I think it's also, it makes him a good sort of conduit for, for younger people who are interested in politics. I think a lot of younger people do gravitate toward Hitchens because he's, he's just more fun <laughs> than a lot of other public intellectuals that, that you might come across. So who would you so. compare him to? Who, who's uh, a, a contemporary of, uh, similar, you know, uh, stature and resonance in the culture oh god i mean he does seem like such a one-off in many ways um the people i follow now and and who i sort of look to for instruction when it comes to writing and thinking are you know like george packer great essayist a friend of hitchens um i think he's somebody who got hitchens very right but i i just i i wouldn't compare him to hitchens necessarily and i certainly don't think he'd compare himself to him would you compare douglas murray to hitchens some people like to do that, you know, his, his, name, <laughs> popped, his name popped into my head, but uh, Douglas Murray is a straight conservative. Uh, I really yeah. don't think Hitchens would appreciate the comparison, yeah. although Hitchens really valued Douglas's work. Um, he wrote a, a positive review of, of a book Douglas wrote when he was 19 years old or something. And Douglas tells a story about how a friend came running across the quad at Oxford or wherever he was going to school and said, Hitchens wrote a nice review about you. And he's like, oh, who's Hitchens? <laughs> You know, so, uh, it, I mean, Douglas is certainly, uh, he's a brutal debater and brutally effective as well. But I think politically, they're quite, quite at cross purposes. Do you think Hitch would have agreed with his European, Europe committing suicide, cultural suicide argument? This is from Douglas Murray. I think he'd have some sympathy with some elements of it. I mean, they were both very hostile toward um, certain int- interpretations of Islam. Um, they were certainly hostile toward uh, liberal capitulations to theocratic pressure coming from Um, some Islamic voices around the world. So on that front, yes, I think he would have identified with the argument. Um, But at the same time, you know, Douglas Murray is not particularly um, attracted to the European project, not a huge fan of the European Union, wrote very eloquently and powerfully against staying in the EU during the Brexit years. Um, And Hitchens was a very strong Europeanist, so they would have disagreed on that. And then I I think Hitchens was much more open to the idea of... um, immigration and and the free movement of, of peoples and ideas across borders, whereas Murray is much more attracted to the idea that a, a nation is a certain set of, of characteristics. And if you alter it too much from the outside, you get something completely different. So nice. yeah, they definitely nice. differ politically. Well, do you think it would be an overstatement to call uh, uh, Hitch the Orwell of our time, even though he's, he's no longer with us, but you know he's more contemporary? 
You know, um, he, he would be delighted to hear it, although he often said, you know, I, I'm not seeking the mantle of Orwell because that would be ludicrous and that would be too self-regarding. Um, but Hitchens was definitely shaped by Orwell in many ways. What's interesting is that stylistically, they're, they're very different uh, from one another, but they're, they're interesting, um, interesting parallels. I mean, both sort of have these martial upbringings, um, both sort of saw, I, I guess, saw why people were conservative growing up and then decided that they really forcefully wanted to push back against that. Um, so I think that Hitchens identified something. Hitchens said that Orwell's social novels, like Keep the Aspidistra Flying, um, had a really big impact on him as a kid. Um, so, it, yeah, I think I think he identified with Orwell. And then it's just Orwell's, you know, such such an incisive uh, commentator on a million issues. Um, like Orwell thought that a United uh, States of Europe was like the only political hope for the continent. He wanted it to be a socialist United States of Europe. But, you know, that's that in that is the seed of the idea of the European Union, which Hitchens always identified with. So, yeah, uh, it, he'd like to be compared to Orwell, I'm sure, even if he doesn't want to admit it out loud to sound, you know. <laughs> out of fear of sounding arrogant or presumptuous. Okay, how Hitchens can save the left that presupposes the left needs saving and that the left is worth saving. Uh, do you want to try to defend those presuppositions? Yeah, I can do my best. You know, um, one of the reasons why I titled the book that way is because Hitchens was very much a man of the left. And I believe he was until the very end. Um, I consider myself on the left, uh, certainly never been a radical as Hitchens was. Uh, I certainly never called myself a Marxist or a socialist. Um, and, you know, I, I just, but I do identify with, with some elements of the left. Um, and there's this intellectual and political lineage that led up to Hitchens's career. And that I think informed a lot of Hitchens's career that I find myself attracted to. I mean, I, I liked Orwell's brand of of left-wing internationalism, for example. I mean, the, the man actually, you know, shouldered a pack and went off and fought in Spain. And then, and, you know, he, but, but you, you, still had, you still had this moral clarity. You know, Orwell thought that World War II was going to lead to, you know, socialist revolution in, in England. And when he discovered that people were capable of just um, keeping on and just sort of like rallying around the flag, he, he just could see the power of patriotism and he could see the power of sort of traditional nationalist values. You know, I think there's that that clear eyed confrontation of both the menace of fascism and then that recognition of like how the society actually functions, coupled with his his essential radicalism. But I think I think Hitchens had a lot of that because um, he was he was a radical universalist and internationalist who also recognized that American patriotism has something to be said for it. And he actually became an American citizen uh, near the end of his life. But I think he did so because he he re he he recognized the United States. Um, represent some of his core values, democracy, individual rights, and, and so on. And there, there's a longer tradition of the left being that sort of like clear thinking, clear eyed, um, moral um, political movement, you know, or, or, you know, political side of the scale. And I think, I think a lot of that's fallen by the wayside. I mean, it's, you know, you just had a conversation with Cornell West. And I, I think a lot of what he said um, sort of encapsulates the, the problems with the modern left, in my in my view. I mean, the man is is just an absolute force of nature, rhetorically, and you know you you can tell he's deeply committed to the causes that he supports. But when when he just repeats the canard that Putin invaded Ukraine because uh, because we promised we weren't going to move NATO an inch eastward, and that we did move NATO an inch eastward, you know, and then when he when he says that you know, the war in Afghanistan is politically and morally comparable to the war in Vietnam. I just think he's, he's making a lot of the mistakes that the modern left makes and that I don't think Hitchens made. And so that's, that's something that, I mean, Hitchens was a, a thinker worth engaging with on foreign policy more than, more than economics, I would say, more than social policy. So you think that the um, resistance to the U.S. support for Ukraine in the conflict with Russia that Cornell gave voice to is a canard uh, you think he's not, he's in a way deluded or he's bought a very overly simplistic and conveniently kind of anti-American posture. Uh, and uh, that Hitchens wouldn't have made that mistake. Neither would he have made the mistake of seeing the uh, decades long frustrating experience of the U.S. Uh, ending in an uh, ignoble withdrawal in Afghanistan uh, likening that to the fiasco of Vietnam, you think those things are very, very different. 
Uh, do you want to elaborate on 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 both of those? I mean, uh, who is Putin? What is the Russian aggression in Ukraine? What is the stake uh, of the West, of uh, Europe, of NATO in uh, resistance? Why is it worth risking nuclear war? How is it uh, overly simplistic, peacenik think uh, for Cornell West to uh, want to raise questions about that? I mean, John Mearsheim here is saying what Cornell West is saying about that. Uh, mm-hmm. conflict. I don't think John Mearsheim is a starry-eyed, uh, misguided leftist. He's probably not a leftist at all. But no, um, no, he's not. you know, um, and uh, what exactly are the differences between the noble war in Afghanistan? Is that your position? And the uh, uh, it, 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 you know, ignoble uh, fiasco of uh, of, of uh, imperial uh, overreach in Vietnam. I mean, I'm asking you to defend your position there. Yeah. Um, What's wrong with what Cornell said? So I do think there's a very clear distinction between the war in Afghanistan and and the war in Vietnam. First of all, uh, the Vietnamese were not harboring terrorists who just massacred 3,000 American citizens in New York City and Washington and Pennsylvania. So that's a critical difference right there. So what, what, what always frustrates me about this debate about Afghanistan is that you were faced with the central dilemma of the war immediately. It, it was almost unthinkable that the United States wouldn't respond or retaliate in some very forceful way after 3,000 people were just massacred in, you know, a couple of our most important cities. Um, so once you invade Afghanistan, well, then what did you do? You created a power vacuum. You removed the Taliban. So we, we had to decide how long do we want to try to fend these people off? How, how hard do we want to work to try to help the Afghans build up their society? I noticed that Cornell West said, we've been there for 20 years. And you sort of emphasize the, the, the length of time we were there. Well, I mean, I think people underestimate the, the scale of the undertaking. I mean, this was one of the most stratified societies on planet Earth, and trying to build a centralized, functioning, democratic government in that country was, was it could possibly have been a doomed effort. It could possibly have been. Um, but I, I also think that uh, there were real strides made in Afghanistan, and it's a mistake not to notice that. It's a, it's a mistake not to notice the massive drop in maternal mortality. It's a mistake not to notice the massive gains for women, huge gains for women in education and health um, across the board. I mean, after the Taliban reasserted control over the country, you know, female judges were hounded and chased down by the Taliban, people who had been in power and people were removed from prison, taken out of prison to pursue the people who had locked them up for crimes against women, for crimes against children. Um, You know, female journalists were ripped out of the newsrooms. Uh, female, in anybody working in any position of, of government or authority in the country was, was yanked from that position. I, I think it's interesting that the left does not seem to care about that. A lot of people on the left just don't, they just say the United States did this horrible thing. It was a rapacious imperial project, full stop, nothing else to say. And I think that's a sort of moral blindness because it's coming from a place of antipathy toward what they regard as the American empire and not a place of, of, of practical recognition of what, what people were going through in Afghanistan and what we faced. So, yeah, and I, I do think that's quite different from Vietnam, which and, and Hitchens always said he despised the war in Vietnam until the very end. And he always defended the, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Iraq is a more tricky car- case, which we can get to uh, if you're interested. But that's just that's on Afghanistan. And then on Russia. Um, yeah, I, if you read Putin's writings, if you read his speeches, you'll see that this is a Russian imperialist in the classic czarist sense. And this was a man who wanted to take as much of Ukraine as possible. They originally moved on Kiev. Um, Russia, he, he's always had designs on Ukraine. The idea of Ukraine becoming a democracy was much more offensive to Putin and much more terrifying in many ways, I would say, than NATO encroachment. And I know that's probably a radical or uh, controversial statement. And you mentioned John Mearsheimer. I, I wrote a piece about Mearsheimer for Quillet, making this exact argument that, that Mearsheimer has been getting it wrong for about 30 years now. I mean, Mearsheimer thought after the Cold War that Germany would end up rearming and and making aggressive motions toward Eastern European states and potentially invading them to use them as a buffer against Russia. And if you look at Germany today, it's that's inconceivable. You know, so the, I think his realist worldview has really blinded him to some of the realities on the ground. And I think the same applies to Cornell West. Brilliant as the man is, you know, I just on this issue, this is the problem with the left, in my opinion. OK, so one of the problems with the left is a blind anti-American, anti-imperial, anti-military stance. And Hitch would have gotten it right, you say. I think, yeah. Okay. Um, What else would he have gotten right? You say the left is worth saving. Why? If they're so, got their heads up their butts, so far up their butts, 
Um, well, you know, I would say that there are some elements of the left today. The German Green Party comes to mind that have really, they've really confronted the mistakes of the past and they're trying to learn from them. And they were pushing for the delivery of heavy weapons to Ukraine before Schultz was, before the rest of Europe was, before the U.S. was. Um, and I, I, so that's the German Green Party. I mean, this is the left. This is the, this is the more radical alternative in Germany. And, you know, I, I think there are a lot of people whose, whose hearts are in the right place on the left and, you know, have, have always been. Um, you know, I, I, was, I was once, I used to be an opinion page editor in, in Kansas, the state of Kansas. And I wrote in favor of Medicaid expansion in the state. Uh, this, is, this is just kind of this long-standing left-wing issue there. And there's like a million issues. Like, I'm, I'm sympathetic toward the idea of single-payer healthcare, you know, universal healthcare. I mean, there's, there are a lot of things on the left that I've always found attractive. And, and I, I like the left's approach to immigration, generally speaking, versus the right. I don't consider myself very Murray-ish uh, when it comes to immigration. Um, and, you know, there's, there's just this general sort of openness that I've always been attracted to. And then there's this history, you know, Eugene V. Debs, uh, George Orwell, um, Bayard Rustin, you know, the, the left has a pretty sterling history in many ways. I mean, you could, you could make an argument that a lot of the best thinkers on the left or that some of their best ideas and principles have sort of been, you know, cast aside, um, these days. I, I write about Rustin pretty often. I read, I read a long essay about him in Quillette saying that he was, he was a real radical, but he was a radical because he was practical, because he, he tried to do things that were actually doable. I mean, that's, you know, I just, I just read Jonathan Igg's uh, Martin Luther King biography. And one of the things that just shines through in that book, which is masterful, I thought, is just the amount of work and the amount of tactical adjustment and the amount of on the ground mobilizing and, and, you know, uh, political effort that the civil rights movement took. And a lot of the people who were central to that movement were on the left. And I just, you know, I just think it's a tradition that deserves respect and deserves to be revived in many ways. Okay. I'm going to have to play uh, the devil's advocate here. And actually I'm not, I'm not the devil's advocate. I, I'm actually the devil. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Socialism hasn't worked everywhere. It's been tried at scale. Everywhere it's been tried at scale, everywhere the left has seized power and been able to implement radical revision of social economic arrangements where it's collectivized, where it's uh, relocated en masse, where it's uh, seized the uh, assets and uh, uh, engendered hostility against the productive classes of uh, burgers and strivers. Uh, you know, everywhere the Marxian vision has actually been put into practice. I think I am I calling you a name by saying if you're on the left, I, I can invoke Marx and I can hold you accountable for his errors. Uh, everywhere the market has been uh, marginalized, uh, where uh, a profit seeking and, and, and striving to accumulate poverty has been denigrated, poverty has ensued. The reason that billions now are able to make their way in the world uh, more effectively than having to face starvation and uh, uh, squalid lives at uh, 35 or 40 year life expectancy in villages all over the developing world is because something that the left would have been against globalization, uh, the penetration of the market, the, the development of capitalistic enterprise in China and in India, et cetera. The left has its head up its ass when it comes to talking about economic development. Uh, it's not just the culture wars. The left is actually wrong about the big questions. Uh, you, you know, you kill the goose that lays the golden egg as soon as you build the welfare state the way that the left wants to build it and so on and so forth. Taxes too high, government too big, unaccountable, et cetera. Yeah, so I will have to say, when, and this is something that will probably give me away to some um, potential readers of my book, even if they're just hate readers, uh, you are pushing at an open door. I mean, I certainly <laughs> call myself a Marxist. I would not call myself a socialist. I think what you just said about how, I mean, if you look at the reduction in extreme poverty around the world since uh, the early 90s in particular, where I think, I think the stat is that uh, the newspapers could have reported every single day that 143,000 people uh, escaped extreme poverty every single day between then and now. That's how many people. A lot of that was due to liberal market reforms. I mean, actions, it was, it was due to capitalism. 
So if that makes if that does make me ineligible, ineligible to even claim to be on the left or lecture the left about anything, and that's unfortunate. But I will say that one thing you mentioned in there was that globalization is sort of anathema to the left. And that that was one issue where Hitchens just he did take a sort of heterodox or iconoclastic line on the left. Hitchens always said he thought globalization was a good thing in and of itself. He always just thought that there should, along with economic globalization, there should be the globalization of a certain standard for what he said were justice and ethics and, and international affairs. So he was in support of like the international criminal or I mean, he's in support of the um, the international tribunals in Rwanda and Yugoslavia. So and he thought Henry Kissinger should be held to account for war crimes in, in Indochina. And this this is this was always a position that he held. And I, I think that 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 view of globalization as a potentially um, as, as a force for good and a force for human flourishing is something that the left should actually take much more seriously. I mean, I actually think that we've gotten to a point where it's just a dirty word. I mean, globalization is a dirty word. You'll, you'll hear Bernie Sanders saying, you know, we need American jobs for American workers. We can't even dream of shipping any jobs overseas when, you know, shipping jobs overseas is just an economic fact of life. I mean, you just if you if you do care about driving down prices for consumers, making industries more innovative. Job, jobs move around. They move around the world. That's just manufacturing bases shift and things happen. So anyway, I, I just, even when Hitchens was a pretty, um, even when he was a much more stalwart sort of Marxist thinker, he did actually have more patience for globalization than many of his uh, erstwhile contemporaries. So just for the record. And, it, you know, maybe I've exposed myself as a neoliberal shill by saying all that, but, you know, it yeah. is what it is. Yeah. Okay. Sinister bullshit. Yeah. Identity politics. This is a hit. Saving the left. Everybody. The left's in trouble. It's worth saving, says Matt Johnson. And one of the reasons it's in trouble is because it's immersed in the sinister bullshit of uh, identity politics, what Hitch called. And Hitch can save us from that too. How so? So... This is uh, an area where, unlike economics, I think his, his sort of left-wing credentials are, are better, firmer. Um, he, was, he was very opposed to identitarianism because he saw it as regressive. He always thought that, he would, you know, in one article he wrote, if, if we were dogs, we would all be the same breed. Like, emphasizing human difference is unhealthy and it's tribal. And it's become very obsessive on the left. Um, you know, I, I've listened to you for years, Glenn, you and John McWhorter. I'm not a fan of the D'Angelo school of identitarianism, not a fan of Kennedy. You know, these guys, I mean, they, they really do frustrate me because I, I even look at this, the history of the civil rights movement. And I just I wonder what Martin Luther King or Bayard Rustin would say about a movement that encourages large audiences of white people and corporations to look inward and identify and root out the racism instead of just looking at inequities in the society and trying to address them on a fundamental level. So I, I just think that this is, it's this toxin that's really, it, it, because it, it's so easy to be tribal. It's so easy to identify with a group, you know? And Hitchens, in, in letters to Young Contrarian, for example, he, he just said that identity politics was this, um, it was it's a cheap excuse for politics. Like it was, it was to the extent that the left was enmeshed in it, which it really has been for a long time, it was giving away one of the most important moral principles that it could hold, which would be uh, universalism, which would be the idea that we, you know, just we should try to move toward a colorblind society. I know that saying that just automatically gets you branded a reactionary. It's like saying all lives matter. Like that's just you're just viewed as somebody who's, you know, um, fighting the, the progress of racial, racial justice in the country. Um, but I really do think that that should be the end goal. And if it takes 200 years, so be it. If it takes 500 years, so be it. But I think there are a lot of people who don't think it's the goal we're striving for. I think they think, you know, that, that race is this eternal fact about us. And racial division is an eternal fact about our politics. And Hitchens always hated that idea. And he thought we could be radical enough to get past it. So um, that, that attracted me to him pretty early on. And I think it's made him more relevant in recent years. So. Why do you think um, the identitarian view of the world has had such success on the left? I mean, you you might have thought even not even without the high ground, the high kind of ethical ground of uh, universalism, a kind of transracial humanism, even without that, just the practical politics of it. I need to build coalitions to get people lined up on the same page behind what I'm trying to achieve. I, I have a left 
agenda. I want universal health care. I want less military spending. I, I want higher wages for workers. I, you know, whatever. How am I going to get it? I need to get a 51% to the polls. How do I do that? I get people of different stripes around the same, you know, agenda and, and we march together. Uh, I, I don't understand. I mean, the, the, the um, susceptibility of a kind of socialistic orientation to all of this special claim, claiming, all of this kind of insular uh, thing. And, and so why has identity politics become such a powerful theme on the left? I mean, uh, I have my own. I have my own theories about it, but I would assume yours are. Uh, I would assume yours are more fleshed out than mine. I mean, I, I just think it's it's a form of inequality that's so obvious. I suppose uh, when people just look differently from you, then um, it's it's easier to say this group is like if you're if you're going to divide people into demographic categories. The kid down the street who, you know, has an alcoholic, abusive dad, you know, who works at the mine and has an unemployed mom and who's just in a low income bra bracket. He's just white. You know, he looks like other white kids. And it's kind of it's harder to sort of suss out like what, you know, what what makes what makes his oppression worse than somebody else's oppression or not as bad or what have you. And then I also do think it's just the history of the country. I mean, I just think because, I, yeah. you know, I, to get back to the King book, I mean, you know, looking at the civil rights movement which was ultimately successful. And it ultimately gives you this sense of historical inevitability, which is probably a mistake because another thing that came out of that biography was just the amount of work it took and just the, the fact that it really didn't seem inevitable at the time. Um, but I think it's understandable for um, black Americans in particular to say, you know, like this, th th we still have these vast inequities. You know, we still have inequities in educational attainment. We saw inequities in health outcomes and massive inequities in um, levels of personal savings and household savings and, and socioeconomic status. So you just see those numbers and you see they're, they have a racial valence. And then you just say, well, the work of Martin Luther King just obviously isn't done and we need to be radical and we need to mobilize on behalf of, you know, the, the most marginalized Americans. So I, 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 just, I do think that's understandable. It's, and to some extent, it's, you know, I, I wanted to actually ask you about affirmative action, for example. Do you think there was a point at which affirmative action was was necessary and then it became less necessary? Or do you think it, it's just always been a sort of retrograde force? I think like Bayard Rustin was always quite suspicious of it and he didn't really like what he regarded as sort of the ghettoization of um, students' educational experiences. Like he didn't like black studies departments. But do you, do you think there was a point at which, because I've always thought that affirmative action was probably necessary like in the 60s, but maybe just became less necessary. Um, but and that's like a race-based thing. So is that identity politics or is it not? I, I do struggle with the sort of terminology here. And, you know. Yeah, I think it's a plausible argument to say that in 1970, 1980, uh, as you were coming out of the civil rights movement and trying to open up institutions, that a state of exception from what should be the principled standard of a non-racial or transracial posture, especially for the government, a state of exception standing apart from that could be defended. I mean, I, I, I think it could go either way. I can, I was around <laughs> in the 1970s and 1980s and I, re, I can remember the debates. I remember uh, Nathan Glazer's book. I think he called it affirmative discrimination. This is like 1978, 1980. Uh, Glazer was a neocon guy. I mean, he was a man of the left in his time. And, you know, then he kind of, became more of a centrist uh, uh, sociologist commentator. And every, I'm, I'm not going to go into a long thing about Nathan Glazer, but I'm just saying, uh, read today, that book would seem very timid. It raised some questions about affirmative action, but it basically accepted the, the fact that, you, you know, something really needed to be done. Uh, so uh, I, this is what I often think when people say, well, you benefited from affirmative action, they say it to me as a critic of affirmative action when I was coming along, uh, I got a scholarship at Northwestern University because I was a minority kid from the South side of Chicago who looked like a pretty good bet. And, you know, I, I had whatever, I don't want to go into my own biography too much, but Clarence Thomas benefited from affirmative action, it is alleged, and therefore, how can he possibly and, you know, I, I, you know, I tell people 1970, 1980 was, was, that was 40, 
plus years ago, man. And and you're talking about building into the ongoing uh, structure of things, a set of policies uh, in a very different demographic uh, landscape, uh, you know. So uh, did I answer your question? Your question was, did I think there was once a time when affirmative action made sense, even if I'm against it mm -hmm. now? And uh, the answer is yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's just it's just a tough issue for me because, you know, I used to have, I think, a more capacious definition of identity politics. I used to sort of think that, you know, we should always tend towards it. Like, you know, if, if the government is thinking about what group to support, I think you should just sort of look at who's objectively suffering the worst and give them the nod based on that. So if there's some kid who's really poor, then that should really be weighed heavily. Like I always thought affirmative action should sort of be more socioeconomic than racial because you can always think of very clear exceptions. You know, I mean, it, it's just, but at the same time, I do recognize that there are a lot of race-based programs that strike me as necessary. And so, you know, I, I remember I, I was in this, I had this written debate with this guy and he was saying I was pretty much just defining identity politics as the forms of identity politics that I don't like. And then saying everything else wasn't identity politics. And I just think I have to sort of take on board the fact that um, some, identi some identity politics is probably necessary. I just don't think we live in a political world where you can't have, you know, small business accelerator programs that are dedicated toward like black kids in school or, and I, I, I'm, I don't know. I mean, on affirmative action, I, I don't know what the right answer is at this point. I'm inclined to think that it's unfair because anytime you have a race-based, especially if it's a quota system, then some races will inevitably suffer. And I think, you know, in, in the case of the elite schools, a, there were Asian Americans or a group that brought the suit said that Asian Americans had to perform at a certain level on the SAT and on other standardized tests that made it just prohibitively difficult for many of them. And that, that seems like this like recipe for civil strife and political hatred when you're, when you're like privileging groups over one another. But yeah, I just, I, I'm trying to think through these issues a bit more exhaustively. And um, I, you know, so talking to you about it's delightful because you've been thinking about them since before I was born. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot, man. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I'm that old. Yeah, sorry uh, to say it, but I think it's probably true. When you said when you said that you're like you were around, it was happening like seventies and eighties. I was born in eighty nine, so yeah, you know, right, I was right, right. At the, right at the end of the Cold War. <laughs> I was born in nineteen forty eight, so there you are. Uh, and I, I think affirmative action has become a crutch. I think uh, it's a distraction from the root sources of persisting disparity. I think it's a corruption that impedes the attainment of genuine equality of standing and respect and dignity for African Americans. Uh, I think it is uh, a cover, a cheap grace for elite portals that are rationing access to the American establishment. They get to genuflect at the altar of justice by the virtue signal that, uh, you know, they set aside in effect a certain number of seats. They change their standards. They, they say they're doing justice. Um, I thought Roland Fryer, uh, my friend, former student and distinguished economist at Harvard, he had a piece in the New York Times just yesterday or the day before, hits the nail on the head. He says, Harvard, Princeton, Dartmouth, Brown, you Ivy League, Penn, uh, Yale, you're, 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 you're so concerned about racial justice, are you? And, and as when I count your collective uh, endowments, it's $80 billion or something like that. I tell you what you ought to do. You ought to establish a network of 500 inner city academic academies oriented toward finding the diamond in the rough smart kids who are bouncing around in these poor neighborhoods and uh, developing them. You know, these are charter schools or these are independent private schools or whatever. So you can afford it. You got the money. And uh, because uh, unless I'm mistaken, it would be racist to presume that there aren't kids capable of rising to the actual standards that you hold everybody else to, like the Asian kids and the Jewish kids and everybody else. They all have to be at the 96th percentile on the test score and they all have to have, you know, real strong academic profiles, but you know, you're, you're, it can't be that you don't think black kids are capable of it. So 
there are diamonds in the rough that are out there. You got the money. Get busy uh, developing an infrastructure that would allow these kids to compete. This this kind of thing. Uh, yeah. You know. Well, yeah. I mean, there was the. I think Bush used the phrase in one of his speeches, but Michael Gerson, his speechwriter, came up with it: the soft bigotry of low expectations. Yeah. It's 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 always stayed with me. Yeah, it just seems like one of those. Yeah, because the question isn't whether people are capable of of this level of attainment in principle. You know, the the question is: are they capable of doing it within some reasonable time frame? Or you know, it's. So it's yeah I, I, that that's that's clarifying. I mean, it's it's useful to look at it in that way. It's just I don't know. I I just look forward to a time in which we can sort of just just inch away from identity based um, politics. I, I I just I just find it 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 seems like it plays to the worst in people, generally speaking, and it presents a lot of contradictions. And it, you know I what we were talking for a couple minutes before uh, before we started the chat. Yeah. Um, about your debate with Hitchens. Um, and it was a debate over reparations. And I, I thought you made a stronger case than, than Hitchens, you know, brilliant as the guy is. Um, and, you know, Hitchens was really radical. I mean, he, he, he made the case for reparations, but yet he hated identity politics. So what, what I was going to ask you is what you think, what, what's the end game for like <sighs> Kendi and for Robin D'Angelo? You know, what if you take the Hitchens line and you say, yes, reparations and you say yes let's like let's establish the the 80 you know let's take the 80 billion dollars and establish all these accelerator programs and these identif identification programs and these academies like just i mean go down the list i mean you could even i know you wouldn't take this view but somebody could say let's uh let's radically rethink criminal justice let's radically rethink the police do all this stuff w would that be enough to brand you sufficiently anti-racist or is it just, i just get the sense that like I just get the sense that your D'Angelo's would just say, oh, no, you're still a racist. Like, you just you really need to keep apologizing for this. You really need to keep saying this <laughs> in yourself. You need to keep like I need to keep doing these corporate classes that cost like 50 grand a pop. Um, like, I, I just yeah. So that's that's one of the reasons why I think Hitchens deserves a listen from people on the left now who are a bit more enamored with identity politics. Is I think he did have I think he kind of had the credibility. You know, I mean, a guy who says he's in support of reparations. I, I remember the ta Coates essay that came out, The Case for Reparations, a while back. I, I remember reading it right when it was published. Yeah. You know, I thought it was well argued. You know, I, you know it's a, I think it's a conceivable case that can be made. But yeah, I, I thought your position was stronger, ultimately, because it's just, it's one of those things that it, it's not going to solve the problem, you know, and it does seem insulting. And it does seem sort of like sidetracking uh, to just say, here's the money. I mean, that, that, that doesn't, that doesn't seem to solve anything. So yeah, yeah, I could go on for a long time about why I think it's a bad idea for our country and ultimately a bad deal for Black people if you want to look at it in those terms. Um, I think it's divisive and, and uh, I think it's built on a phony kind of intergenerational ethical equity argument. Uh, uh, I, th I think it commodifies something that ought to be almost sacred. I mean, the, the idea that history has consequences and the history of slavery has racial consequences is, I think, clearly true. The question of how does a multiracial democratic society manage those consequences is a hard problem. And I think this idea that my ancestors built this country, I'm going to say that to the descendants of immigrant Irish or uh, of uh, immigrant South Asians or something like that, this great country, my ancestors, I'm saying as a black person, my ancestors, their unrequited labor built this country. Make that kind of claim, make that kind of peremptory move. You know, I, I, I demand, you know, uh, we're, we're all in this together. And I, and I, I think that this is an American problem in this kind of uh, black people sitting on one side of a bargaining table with the rest of the country. I, th I think that's a very bad idea and and plus at a at a kind of practical level given the scale of transfers that would have to be undertaken and the the racialized character of the status of people as beneficiaries in receipt of these transfers it, it it's got a kind of south africa kind of feel to me i mean it, it it's it's just not it's not the way we want to go in my opinion just, yeah 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 i mean but you um, asked me you asked me what did i think was going to happen and and I think there's going to be, and there is already discernible, a backlash. 
I, and and I and I think this is a this is a losing hand that's being played here. Where you think that the race card, you are racist because you're racist because you're against affirmative action or reparations, or you're racist because you respond to politicians who make uh, uh, make something out of the fact that the blacks are overplaying. You're racist because you see the summer of 2020 George Floyd riots for what they were, not a advance of the causes of justice, but but rather a, a you know kind of something almost on the comparable to January 6th in the mind of the of the uh, those who are trying to preserve our democracy is, is a fundamental threat to the integrity of our of our civil order. Unjustified. You think George Floyd is not a hero, but you think he's actually, you know, representative of a certain tendency in the society, which, you know, can't uh, solicit your approval. I think that sentiment, uh, I, I think the George Soros DAs throughout the country are going to not be uh, persistently politically successful. Um, I think the uh, Donald Trump type politicians who uh, make use of this racial resentment will have more and more influence. Uh, so I, I think not only are we not going to get reparations, that the advocacy for reparations is going to alienate a lot of people who might have otherwise have been uh, more sympathetic to the uh, uh, legitimate causes. And the legitimate causes are mainly class based claims about addressing people in need. They're not the racial reparation claims uh, that are faulty for the reasons that I've suggested. That's what I think. Yeah, I, I, don't think, I don't think it's a coincidence that a lot of people who are on the hard traditional left tend to, they actually tend to distrust um, identity politics. They tend to distrust identity-based politics. So, you know, like Chomsky's never really been much of a, He's not really woke. Uh, Hitchens has a history as a, as a Marxist, and he, he always thought identity politics was short-circuiting people's brains and was, was cutting. You're not doing any of the hard work of trying to identify how to improve educational outcomes or how to reduce poverty. You know, you're, you're, you're just, it's just grievance-based politics. It's just scolding. Um, so then there are other people on the left. I mean, Bernie Sanders, you know, he, he said during the primary in 2020, um, we should choose the next president on the basis of ideas and principles and functional, you know, political program. We shouldn't choose the president based on gender, race, um, sexual identity, anything else. And he, and he, he got savage. Yeah. And he was panned for that. Yeah. He was, yeah. he was ripped to shreds for it. And this is, a, you see this over and over again among a certain class of, of left winger. And the, a lot of the time, these are the people who are just sort of traditional inclined towards socialism. And, you know, you can take it all the way back to Rustin, who was also a socialist and who, who really did get he got uneasy when people started. Like he said reparations was a harebrained idea. He thought it was a terrible idea. Um, he you know, and he was he was just like brutally consistent about that. I think he had mixed feelings about some forms of affirmative action, but that's beside the point. Um, I just think there's so this is a radical tradition that is flying in the face of the sort of chic uh, contemporary identitarianism. And that's that's another reason why I think Hitchens is is a powerful voice is because he he sort of represented that in a pretty compelling way. And I think just his his explicit anti-tribal focus, his explicit focus on universalism was valuable. And I, I wish the left would sort of rediscover it. I think by Dresden's uh, anchorage in the union uh, movement and uh, whatnot is one of the reasons why he had some ambivalence about affirmative action, because he could see the. Uh, you know, ethnic whites in the cities and the blacks and the conflict. Uh, but, but I don't know. And I, th I think he realized that the movement had to be a big tent movement, too. I mean, I just think that's there, there are interviews of him later, years after the civil rights movement, where he said, we did, you know, the, the march on Washington was the march for jobs and freedom. I mean, it's like they, they tried to package this as, as a universalist project. And Rustin yeah. would always say, like, the movement's gone beyond the lunch counters. It's gone beyond desegregation. Like he wrote an article for Commentary where he said the legal foundations of segregation were, have been destroyed. So what we have to do now is a broad-based political program that improves conditions for everybody. I mean, an anti-poverty program. And that just, that seems like the good, radical, politically workable position. If the left wants to, if the left cares about poverty <laughs> reduction and amelioration, 
instead of just self-flagellation. That's the sort of politics I think they should pursue. And that's, yeah, you know, I just, I noticed that about Hitchens early on. And then I just, it's, you consistently see these threads with people who um, sort of like represent radical values, but it's like radical pragmatism, you know, it's, you know, they're, they're still trying to do things that work in the world. And yeah. It, uh-huh. Fearless liberalism, fearless liberalism. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, if there's one word that describes Hitchens, both rhetorically and politically, I'd say fearless does it pretty well. I mean, he's just, he was really not afraid of challenging his own side, such as it was. Um, when he came out in support of NATO involvement in, in Bosnia, for example, his friends were horrified and disgusted. Um, obviously, after September 11th, when he supported the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, and disowned the nation and uh, moved away from what he called the Chomsky Zinn Finkelstein quarter of the left. Uh, he he was not loved for it, and he was called a, an imperialist. And you know, after after he died, Glenn Greenwald wrote this article in Salon where he said he was a sadist. He just wanted to kill Muslims, which is interesting for a guy who was supporting the defense of Bosnian Muslims in the '90s and supported the defense of the Kurds in Iraq, who were also Muslim. But hey, put that aside. Supported the Northern Alliance in Afghanistan. But anyway, I, I think he had a lot of guts. And, you know, he just, you know, there's one time where he's on Bill Maher's show and he said something about the Iraq war. He kind of got booed and they just flipped off the audience and then just carried on. You know, he just had this kind of <laughs> fuck you have out. You seen, you know? Have you seen Norman Finkelstein's uh, book, um, I'll Burn That Bridge When I Come to It? Yeah, I heard of it. I, I actually uh, listened to some of your chat with with him. He, yeah. He's another one of those, yeah, I... Last thing I want to do is really wade into, I, you know, it's even having him on your show. I know, I know you got a lot of pushback. Oh man, yeah, don't talk is. about Israel Palestine. Whatever you yeah. do, please. It's worse than the YouTube censors. The YouTube oh, censors won't let me talk about transgender stuff. They they will say that it's hate speech. If you know, because I had a guy on and they took down the video because they said it was hate speech. I'm not going to repeat what he said because I don't want him to take down this video. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, okay. For the record, but, I but think a lot of what, uh, let Norman Finkelstein come on your program and say anything, you know, uh, anti-Zionist about the Israel-Palestine thing. And there is no end to the complaint about how you allowed that to happen. So I should self-censor and, and, and not speak of the issue at all. But I, won't. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, it's just I, for the record, I actually think a lot of what Finkelstein says is abhorrent. I mean, I, I do think that He's somebody who's not going to stare the, the horrors inflicted by Hamas in the face, in my opinion. I mean, this is and this is also a movement that think about it. Like these are people who will not they, Hamas does not have the military capability to do anything. And they're not going to invade Israel, they're not going to take over Israel, they're not going to run the Zionists out. So they fire missiles into Israel and then get responded to, as any country would, and that automatically kills more Palestinians. You know, and this happens so frequently. And it, it's just like the level of cynicism that it would take to be Hamas is quite horrifying and quite disgusting. And I just always feel like the Finkelsteins of the world, they do what Hitchens did not do. Hitchens was an anti-Zionist. Hitchens thought the project was a bad idea. He thought it was tribal. He didn't like it. You know, and it, there are people who think even that position is anti-Semitic. And there were people who accused Hitchens, who discovered late in life that he was Jewish, who accused him of being anti-Semitic. Um, but I, I think he struck a, a, a good, interesting radical balance where he was critical critical of of israel frequently and in print but he also had absolutely no patience or time for the theocrats who live next door to israel and who impose a sleepless threat on their israeli neighbors you know and i just think but i just think finkelstein's always he's always downplaying one of those and upplaying the other and that that i find noxious um but i will also say that there are a lot of people who go on and on about free speech, and they say it's it's important to just have an open dialogue and to discuss these things. And they will simultaneously still regard some people just absolutely beyond the pale, you know, and I'm sure Finkelstein would fall into that bucket. So it's clear that you, I mean, to the extent that you believe in the free exchange of ideas, like you you have you have a range of people on the show. I mean, there's really Really, no doubt about that. I mean, to have Finkelstein on one day and then to be talking to McWhorter and then then Cornell West, and it's just like I don't know. It's it's a quite quite vast range of people. But yeah, the, the question of platforming is just it's really nuanced. It's really complicated. I don't I don't really know where the lines should be drawn. Well, man, I, I think we kind of reached the end of the hour here, and I have to add Matt Johnson to that name of uh, interesting people that I've had on the show. And thank you for your. Uh, for your courage, uh, your fearlessness, and uh, taking some of the stance that you've taken, uh, and for your book, 
uh, how Hitchens can save the West. Is that I don't know, how Hitchens almost. can save liberalism? It's, it's, it's almost it's almost how Hitchens can how, save how the Hitchens West. How Hitchens can save the left? How Hitchens can save the left? Rediscovering yeah. uh, fearless liberalism in an age of counter enlightenment. Yes, sir. That's the whole thing. The whole bit. Matt writes for Haaretz, and he writes for Quillette and other outlets. Uh, and people should get his book. It's very interesting. Thanks for coming on the show, Matt. Thanks for having me. It was fun.